He begins by saying, by the deeds of the law, law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Now, the first question is, to what is he referring when he refers to the deeds of the law? There have been those who are saying that, that this is a restrictive passage, that it only refers to the ceremonial requirements of the Old Testament law. And that what the apostle is saying here is that nobody's justified by going through all of the actions that God commands uh, as he did the Jews, going through the sacrificial system and all of the uh, cultic practices that were associated with the tabernacle and later with the temple. In other words, he's saying that nobody's going to be justified by following the rituals that the law commands. And again, that's a very restrictive application of the text. The vast majority of commentators, however, say no. Paul's not simply limiting this to uh, the performance of ritual, but rather to all that the law commands, including all of the moral obligations that God's law imposes upon his creatures. And so he's saying that by the obedience to the law of God, both cultically, ritually, as well as morally, by the keeping of these, no one will ever be justified. So in that sense, any kind of good work, as we would perceive it to be, is excluded from the grounds of justification. Now, others, have again, limited this passage to say that no works of obedience done prior to regeneration will add to our justification, but then they say, but what we do after we're reborn will be the grounds of our justification. So again, works are brought back into the, into the house here as the grounds for justification. And again, uh, this is part of the dispute between Rome and Protestantism because the Protestant view takes this to mean that no works ever done at any time are the grounds for our justification, even the works that are done after we're converted or the works that were done after we receive grace. Those works that they may contribute to our reward in heaven are never part of the grounds of our justification. Now the apostle goes on, <coughs> excuse me, let me just say this. Again, when he's talking about justification, he's not talking simply about a work of divine pardon. There's a difference between being pardoned and being justified. A person is pardoned who has already been declared to be and convicted of being guilty. And after they're convicted of being guilty, the governor or the president may execute their executive privilege of giving clemency and pardoning these people, that is, excusing them from the punishment that is due to their guilt. But justification is not simple pardon. Now, part of justification involves the forgiveness of sins, but the essence of justification is declaring a person just. So in one sense, you don't have to pardon somebody who's been declared righteous. People who are righteous have no need of pardon. And so that the point of justification goes beyond the forgiveness of sins that is ours in the cross and all the rest to the declaration by God that we who are in Christ and who possess faith are counted righteous before him. That's why we've said all along that the imputation of somebody else's righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, is so fundamental and essential to our understanding this work of justification.